The Fed indicated they are wary about cutting rates too soon in the path to normalizing the macroeconomic environment. Historically speaking, are we just repeating old cycles or are we in the middle of rewriting the history books? And what should investors be doing about it? We've got that and a whole lot more right now on UBS Trending. Hi, everybody, and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm Anthony Pastore. I am thrilled to be here with my friend and colleague for many years through various companies, Ed Kirshner, Chief Portfolio Strategist from Columbia Threadneedle. Ed, it is a pleasure to be here with you, my friend. Great to see you today. And they ditto. I, I love working with you. I, I do, know. too. Same thing. So let's get into it. It's like there's so much still uncertainty out there right now. Well, no, there's always a lot of uncertainty, Anthony. I, I would say the, the question is, are we at a transition point? I mean, the economy is still growing. Inflation is going down, but it's too high. Yeah, yeah. You know, do we resolve inflation before we end up in recession? Do we have to go into recession to kill inflation? Remember, recession is not just negative GDP growth. And do we have to see higher unemployment and lower capacitization? So far, that hasn't been the case. At, but yes, I totally agree. We're not, but it could, it could. There is no data to support that we're in a recession. Right. I just have to wrestle with the New York Fed model that says we're there by summer. There's two things important about ZERP. Tell me. The first thing is we've been in ZERP since the global financial crisis, 2008. A zero interest rate environment is very different than normal. The last ZERP was during the Depression. So that's not normal. And the Fed has said ZERP is over, right? Not only, not only talking about where we're going, but there is no dot plot at zero. Well, didn't they say that in 2022? Because we, we kind of went back to ZERP because of the pandemic. Yeah, we well we blipped up, then we came back down to right. The, yeah, we had the Fed was brilliant. Right, they overcompensated because we didn't want the pandemic to become a depression. Yeah. Okay. So the nice thing about inflation is it's easier to kill inflation than deflation, because you can always raise rates as high as you need to. But we learned the hard way: if you have deflation, negative rates doesn't work. Mm. Japan, Europe. So the Fed would rather err on getting inflation slowly down, then quickly down, because they don't want to go too far, but they want to get it down. Well, what about, so, but see, the, but then that brings up the question about quantitative tightening. QE and QT was brilliant. Right, but you think, do you think, because. It changed all the rules. It sure did. Because all they used to control was the front end of the yield curve. Now they control the entire yield curve. That's mm -hmm. what it means, right? Yeah. So the 10 year, three month spread, which is the old Fed model, might not be as meaningful because it's not market expectations, it's Fed-influenced expectations. So that's how we have to, you know, I'm going to tell my MBAs if I do a guest lecture, we got to go revisit this and see if the model is going to work in a period where the Fed uses QE and QT. Do you know that during the Depression, the Fed raised rates and the government raised taxes? Totally opposite of conventional wisdom today mm -hmm. because the job of the Fed was to maintain stability of the dollar. That was it. We're in the gold standard. So they had to maintain credibility in the dollar by raising rates. It, it's, there's a reason a bad economic downturn turned into a recession. Bad monetary and fiscal policy. Interesting. And if you go back to what happened in 2008 and 9 with the Great Recession, what, what re I mean, obviously we know about the subprime mortgage market. We know that banks made some really bad bets. What really got that moving into the place that we were, people were losing jobs? 10.2% unemployment. I mean, it was insane to see what was happening back then. Yeah, um, basically it was a bubble where people thought you can actually get rid of risk that if you, you know, bought a lot of junky mortgages, right. but you took a little bit of each, so you had a thousand pieces of junk. You know what you call a thousand pieces of junk when you put them together? Junk. <laughs> right. They're no better than a single piece junk of junk. Junk is junk is junk is and junk. And what we learned, and that, then they, I remember one conversation when I was at Smith Barney, where the, somebody came in to push this ARS, and they said, look, you know, there's so much demand, we're issuing synthetic mortgage Securities, uh, ARS, auction rate securities. Of course, I remember I said, those well, days. then there's counterparty risk. You go, Ed, counterparty risk? We're talking about people like Lehman. You telling me there's risk there? I go, oh, Fast forward, funny. right? Huh? Fast forward. Yeah. People coming out of Lehman with boxes in their hands. People assumed that these rocket scientists knew what they're doing. Yeah. It's sort of like the, you know, the dot com in, in 99, 2000. It's like the, um, today what we're having in AI. Look, internet is phenomenal. Yeah. You know, AI is going to be phenomenal. I just keep wondering if artificial intelligence is going to be the way that we're going to finally see a, not a real bubble, but like these technology companies doing something where you can look at the fundamentals and say, there's a reason why the market caps are growing. You had the same thing on the internet, and the internet changed our lives dramatically. Yeah. Boosted, it was phenomenal. 
but you weren't worth the price. Mm. I mean, it's just a lure of large numbers. If you take some of these mega, mega caps, if they grow at 10% for 10 years, they're gonna be bigger than the GDP of Europe. Yeah. Can you, I mean, GDP is sales. So are they gonna sell more AI than the GDP? I mean, you reach absurd. I wanna sort of dip into this idea that you said that um, current inflation was not due to classic demand overload, but supply restrictions. Are you talking about what happened during heyday of the pandemic when we had these barges offshore US coming from China that were just sitting there because no one's at the port to take them off and start delivering them, putting them on trucks. Well, first to give credit where credit is due, I did not say that inflation was not due to classic demand overload. Chairman Powell did. Ah, okay. Okay, and he's the one who sets policy, so listen to him more than me. And indeed it was. You had basically supply interruption first of goods, but just out of labor. I mean, the labor participation rate went boom, down, mm -hmm. right? Well, we're back to trend already, okay? And there is no goods inflation anymore. The latest PC in goods deflator inflation is minus 0.1%. Zero, okay? There's no shortage of stuff anymore, but we have a shortage of labor. And it's really simple. The real major, I mean, look, first of all, labor participation rate is back to trend but trend has been going down since 2007 because of the retirement of 65 to 74 year olds. There's a lot more baby boomers out there who are retiring and they're leaving the workforce. And then there's young people like yourself or even younger who aren't making kids until they turn 40. I know. When, when I was 40, I had teenagers. I mean, I, my wife didn't birth them at that age. You know, that's what they became. Right. So we don't have much, labor growth is about 1.6% per year, half immigration and half procreation. Yeah. So we don't have much labor growth, unemployment 3.7, sort of, I think it's near an all time low. And I mean, one statistic that Powell mentioned, but a lot of people don't understand, you gotta really parse him closely because he's so brilliant. He talked about that there's less than one worker for every open job. That number's unprecedented. How does that even work? It's like saying you're gonna have 2.4 children. You, know, you do those averages. How does that even work? There's 0 0.7 workers for every opening. So there are many more job openings that are yeah. out there right now. To give you, so 0 0.7 today, at the peak of the pandemic, five and a half workers per job opening. Ah. At the peak of the global financial crisis, six and a half workers per job opening. We've never been in balance like this, but if you think about the implication, which gets really, it's not on inflation as much as, it's on the capacity for GDP to grow. If labor force is growing 1.6% and productivity is struggling to get much past one plus, GDP is gonna grow two and a half real, not three and a half or four. Yeah, that creates inflation. Right. So the Fed's mandate, of course, we know is inflation. They have a 2% target or thereabouts. Well, no, it's, it's a dual mandate. Now it's a dual, right. It has always been a dual mandate. Jobs. Promote growth, i.e. jobs, and control inflation. Right. And we're the only central bank with a dual mandate, only major central bank. Bank of England in price stability, uh, ECB, successor to the Bundesbank, price stability. We've got this dual, which makes a more difficult mandate. Right. And then you think about, as you said, Jay Powell, pretty brilliant guy, really has an understanding, I think, of what's going on. But he sees jobs continuing to grow while inflation is starting to come down. So the question is, what comes next? Well, he's got to slow demand growth mm. so that jobs are in balance with supply. He's already done it for goods. There are no bottlenecks anywhere. There are no shortages of anywhere. You know, you can get as many t-shirts as you want. You can get lumber to build your house. You know, all all, all those, those essentials. That's, it's interesting that, um, that you, yeah, you look at some of these uh, key indicators, and especially when you look at uh, we're in the middle of earnings season. But let me ask you, Ed, just as we're sort of like thinking about this from an investment perspective, where are we looking? Is it, is, the fixed income, is it fixed income? Is it equities? Is it a combination of both? Obviously, we think a diversified portfolio is the way to go, even when looking at private equities and, and credit in a portfolio. Where do you see opportunities, given the environment that we're in? I'm just a nerd for numbers. Love it. Okay, I've never said in my opinion I expect. And I tell the MBAs, your job is to find the most relevant data to use in models and use them until you're sure they're broken. So in, in, in terms of you know, where the best investments are, well, if you look at spreads between stocks and bonds, well, spreads, you can't look at spreads. Yes, you can. You look at earnings yield versus bond yields. Yeah. Instead of looking at PE, look at E over P. Right now, to get stocks and bonds in equilibrium versus history, you'd have to have bond yields 250 basis points lower. What does that math say? We want to be bonds, we want to be longer duration. So there's definitely an opportunity in the bond market. You need to actively select. Um, if I had to pick where I want to be in equity, we call it quality value. 
okay? Um, companies that have high free cash flow. Why? Because historically they tend to do well as an economy slows. Why? Because right. historically they tend to do well as an economy slows. If you ask me why again, I'll give you an excuse. Why do you want high free cash flow? Well, when rates are high, you want companies that are self-funding. Makes sense. Okay, so you can look at the math. You gotta get more granular. It's not growth versus value. It's not small versus large. It's balance sheet and income statement characteristics. You can do really well in stocks going forward. You can't just do it by buying the market benchmark. Right. Ed, thank you. I wish we had more time. It's all, I love sitting here with you, and I, we go way back. You and I have been in, the, in, the, uh, in various in companies various, together uh, incarnations. For, for a long time, so it's always good to sit with you. I love getting a chance to, to pick your brain. Pleasure. Good to see you, my friend. Absolutely. Thank Same you. Here. Thank you. And for more information, please visit our website, ubs.com forward slash views. And as always, make sure you're talking to your financial advisor. We've mentioned a lot of things today that you could potentially having a conversation with them about, so make sure to reach out to them. And follow us on all the social media platforms, including Instagram at UBS Trend is our account where you're going to find content here in the studio that you won't find anywhere else. In the meantime, I'm Anthony Pastore. Thanks very much for joining us, everybody. Have a great day, and remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.